just a little ESPN fun note. Um, how long does it take you to prepare for that, for that obit? Um, or is it hard to squeeze it into three minutes? Uh, just maybe yeah. get a little insight. Okay. So like, uh, for example, on a day like that, I was actually in this room, um, and it was a week ago and, um, I got word about, you know, what happened. And when I say this room for, for people that are not, uh, um, having a visual of the podcast, I, I'm in my basement and it's kind of like a semi man cave taken over by three kids. We got a dollhouse behind me and, and we've got a lot of other, uh, toys on the, on the ground. Uh, I was in this room and I got word about John's passing and literally, you know, after that, um, I'm texting my bosses. We're trying to get information. And, um, so this is in the afternoon and we have a 6 PM sports center and I got in, um, and I started writing the obit around three 15 and it took me an hour. And, and I mean, to be transparent, um, you know, I, I had to take a couple breaks. I was pretty emotional. Uh, there's a lot of tears at my desk at ESPN and my co-anchor that day, Ryan Smith, um, came over and caught me in a mid cry. <laughs> and, and, and we, you know, by the end of the conversation, we're talking and laughing because he's a Philadelphia guy too. And his father, um, was at Cheney State. So we were sharing some John Cheney stories and it was, it was the best thing. He was a phenomenal teammate. So I'm, I'm writing this whole thing out. I get the, the piece written and done at four o'clock. Then I have to send it to the assignment editor, a news editor who has to check it. I have to send it to two of my bosses um, and not my bosses, but my producer and coordinating producer who I'm working with and a researcher. And they're all proofreading the piece and they're just making sure everything I'm saying lines up and all that. Then after that, after everybody approves it about 15 minutes later, because we're on a deadline now, I have to go track the piece. So I track the piece and now it's 4.30. I have to now send it to the video editors and two people who have been pulling tapes and videos because you know, you're know you you're looking for, for, for video on file that's 20, 30 years old, right? Um, so they have to pull that video. And now the deadline is this, you've got to turn this around from 4.45 to 6 p.m. And they're now working on a deadline. Now I start writing the 6 p.m. show, the hour show, and I start writing at 4.30. So you're, you know, you're, you're writing on deadline mentally, boom, 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 boom. And um, it was supposed to air at the end of the A block around 6.07. And instead we called an audible and said, let's, we want to do it right. We want to finish this the right way. So Kevin, we're going to have you on camera uh, for, for your reader on John explaining the story about the first time I met him. And then we'll, we'll show a graphic of his ac accomplishments. If you went to a Temple basketball game in the 80s or 90s, you can still hear that voice bellowing instructions from the sidelines. And it came from a man who was once sharply dressed, but now his tie undone and his sleeves all rolled up. That man was John Chaney. The Hall of Fame coach died today, eight days after his 89th birthday. And the first time I met Chaney was after one of the famous early morning practices as a college reporter. And he asked me where I was from. And I mentioned my hometown. I was a little nervous. And he said, I don't care about that. Where are your parents from? We went to his office and we talked about my parents' journey from India. And he wanted to taste my mom's Indian food. We spent over two hours talking about life, not about hoops. And that's who John Chaney was. Go to break. And then in the B block, which is going to be, you know, from like 6... Uh, 11 to 624, we're going to air that the John Cheney piece. And I'm like, okay, so all of that is going on in the middle of the show. And, you know, you're adapting and adjusting. And that's what that's what it's like on a daily basis, because, you know, we'll have breaking news um, that comes down at 530, that comes down at 445, that sometimes comes down at 615, Colin, and, and it's nonstop. And, uh, there's nothing nine to five about my job on a daily basis, but that's why I love what I do. There's nothing more satisfying than killing a, uh, well, I shouldn't say there's nothing. You, you could probably speak on this, but there's nothing more satisfying than killing something that, you know, you didn't have a lot of time to do and you just, boom. Yes, hey, Colin, and it's very relatable and you, you actually get a taste of both worlds because you, you understand the media aspect, but very relatable to your experience as a football player. Um, Sometimes there's moments where you're doing nothing 
and it's it takes some time and then all of a sudden boom gotta go right and that's kind of how it is with us sometimes you're waiting and waiting and then boom you got 15 minutes to turn something around you got 20 seconds to turn something around it's the same way and this all goes back to the preparation uh while you're waiting and if you could prepare and prepare prepare then you're ready for that 15 second turnaround and at the same time the adrenaline rush nothing will meet what you experience on a Saturday and Sunday, catching a pass and feeling the crowd. Nothing touches what I can do on a daily basis on the air when the red light's on. It just, it, there's just nothing. I mean, maybe the only thing that can touch it for me is speaking to a live audience or going on the road and you're in an environment where, you know, you're, the scene set is the field behind you and you have, you know, thousands of fans screaming. Nothing can touch that. 